Okay, so how stands the case? You're in training to become a king by God's decree. Your lifestyle is to learn and live on Bible, applying it to everything in your life. And that means that there's a whole lot of stuff in this world that you sort of have to just ignore. The world is real busy on what it does, its works, its accomplishments, its performance, and people who do not know what the Word of God says insert their own ideas about working, 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 and put God's name on those ideas. That, of course, is Satan's strategy in the trial because what Christ did, what would Jesus do? What did he do? He learned the word, Matthew 4.4. 4. He lived on it, Matthew 4.4. 4. He didn't run around doing works. We only hear about him once before he's 30. And what is he doing that once we hear about him when he's 12? He's talking scripture in the temple. And his parents have forgotten about him for three whole days. They're halfway home. It's about six days journey from the temple to Nazareth where they lived. Because the streets were, you know, the roads were crowded. So they had to double back, and there he is in the temple. And they say, oh, we've been looking all over for you. Well, didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? Yeah, where else is he going to be if his job is to become the word, the truth? That was his job. That's how he paid for our sins. Isaiah 53, 11. By thinking... Not by working. Everything on the cross was done to him. Oh. So what is your job then? If you're supposed to be like Christ. And every one of us who's a Christian said, yeah, that's what we're supposed to do. Okay, how are you going to get to be like Christ if you don't do what Jesus did? What did he do? Matthew 4.4. 4. Are we doing that? Oh, but he also said, you know, whoever gives a cup of water in my name. Yeah. What kind of reward goes with a cup of water? Did he give cups of water in God's name? No. He had somebody give him a cup of water, though. The Samaritan woman at the well. And what did he give her? A taste of the fact that he's God. Telling her about her past husbands. He gave her words. Which she believed. And was therefore saved. Words save. Works depend on words. Okay, so if you're working and you don't got the right words in you, then your works are whose, based on whose words? Not God's. I mean, this is getting to the point about, you know, how fair is God to have this rule that, hello, you got to believe some words that he says in a book in order to be saved. And after that, you can't lose your salvation, but you got a whole bunch of other words you got to learn in order to think like the word who saved you. That's what God wants. That's Hebrews 11:6. And if you do what he wants, theme of James 2, being a doer of the word, 
means that you're learning it, thinking it. That's how you do a word. How do you do a word? It's sitting on the page. How do you do something that's sitting on a page? You learn it. You remember it. Otherwise, you're like a guy who looks at himself in the mirror and immediately forgets what he sees. That's what James is saying in James 2. Be a doer of the word, not works. He's writing to believers who are busy working. Jews in the diaspora is his audience. As he says many times in that epistle, it's not written to unbelievers. Same thing for the book of Hebrews. It's written to Jews in the diaspora, specifically in Jerusalem. They should have gotten out. The temple's just about to go down. He's telling them to get out. Or otherwise they'll be destroyed along with the temple. Because the temple was foreknown to be destroyed. Paul metered that in his Greek back in 56, roughly 56 AD. And when the writer of Hebrews is writing, it's 14 years later. Right on schedule in Paul's meter. Well, did they listen to the words of the book of Hebrews? No. So what happened? They got destroyed. Word versus works. That's the deal. God's plan, God deeds, word. Satan's plan, Satan's deeds, works. Now, is God fair to have a standard that, well, you have to do his word, which means you can't do works because you've only got so many hours in a day, you can do God or mammon. The cultural idea behind the Aramaic word mammon is that you're all involved in the world. It's not just about money. The idea of business transactions. Everything with the body is some kind of business transaction. You're getting the body ready. You're cleaning it. You're feeding it. You're, you know, it's the business of the body. Words or works? God's plan or Satan's? God or mammon? Is God fair? To give you this standard and rule of learning his words when there's so many things in the world that need to be done. That's Satan's argument. And it's real obvious, hopefully by now in this series, that, hello, everything, everything you do and think and are, God is watching. Who made you? Who to whom do you owe whatever it is you are and do? It's your creator. What's the first commandment? There's no people in the first commandment. Not even you. Except the command to you. You shall love what? The Lord. With all your what? Your heart and all your what? And soul. And then the Lord upgraded it in, in, in Matthew. And thinking, the anoia, is the upgrade on the word. In the Hebrew Old Testament, it's all your strength, which includes your goods. Everything you got. All of it. Even in the Old Testament, it was everything you got. The Lord upgraded it to all your thinking, too. Well, then there's no room for anything else. How are you going to obey the first commandment then? You can't. So then you're in violation of the whole law. That's also in James 2. What? what how, uh, uh, yeah! How fair is that? You got to take care of your body, don't you? What about the bills? What about your family? What about all your other obligations? Don't you have to do something about them? Well, yeah, but there's a certain way to go about it. Through the Bible, you're learning. Of course, if you're not learning it, then everything you do is due to. And Satan's plan is being sponsored. And 
vetted and furthered and aided. Well, how fair is that? I mean, just sit around and study Bible all day? Well, no, you have things you do during the day and you use Bible on everything. That's God's order. That's how Christ lived. Matthew 4, 4, always occurring. You live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Not only on bread. In other words, God first. First commandment. That's God's order. Like it, lump it, call it fair. Call it unfair. Hmm? You could even call it mm -hmm, arbitrary. The world has all these needs. That's what Satan's saying in the first temptation. The world has all these needs and you're ignoring them. But you demand that we learn your word first. Yeah, Christ said so. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things will be added to you. First. See? First. Okay? So it doesn't mean you sit on a park bench or go off like a hermit and what happens if you do that I don't want to learn God I'm not just learning the Bible to buttress my ego oh I know 10 Hebrew and Greek words yeah so what a 5 year old could have learned them too did you learn anything about God from it Oh, no, I just buttressed my ego because now I know 10 Hebrew and Greek words. Oh, yeah, well, okay. You'll get your reward stroking your own ego, having somebody else stroke it for you. But the real reward is to learn God. And that's not only what happens. Okay, we saw at the end of, what was it, 10B... What did God say in that mock-up conversation to Satan, which really is taking place? I just don't know the exact words. But we know them from Job. Okay, <clears throat> you're making this accusation about these people who are studying me because that's my command to them. So I guess I'll just bless everybody around them. See, because we can't do the works. we got to do the word instead of the works. So God will do the works. So God, I can't, I can't give to charity because i got to spend my time on Bible, which means I'm not hustling making money to get the money to give to the charity or using the money i got to give to charity because I don't know how you want me to spend it. So will you spend it? He'll say yes, because I can ask anything in his name, and he'll do it. So can you. So if you can ask for the works that you think ought to be done, then you don't do them. When you pick up the phone and order a pizza... You're not making the pizza. Somebody else is making the pizza. Okay, and you don't think that's wrong? Do you suddenly say, oh, I should make my own pizza? Uh-huh. Well, maybe you should spend your time on something else. That's why you're picking up the phone to order the pizza, because you don't even have time to cook. Okay, well, you don't. You ask God for all those things. Besides, you can't even do them as well as he can. And then you're doing for God, your employer, your boss, your creator, your father, what he wants done. And you're not running around like everybody says you should. And... You're learning a kingly thought pattern that's an executive thought pattern that's a ruling thought pattern. And you know what? you got to learn it.
because nobody else is doing it. They're busy hustling in Satan's plan. So they're bodies without heads. And if you get his head into your head, like 1 Corinthians, so that's the theme of the book, then you will be a head crowned as a king in heaven. Now, I've said that enough times and in enough ways that what I've just said in these last 15 minutes should be familiar to you. What I haven't touched enough on is the, how do you want to call it, fairness of that. God set a rule. Learn my son. That pleases him. He watches you. He made you. Your first obligation, if you're going to talk about it that way, is to him. Whether he was right or wrong or arbitrary or anything else. If we're going to evaluate this argument of fairness, then you know what? The guy who's paying your bills is the one to whom you first owe allegiance. Who's paying your bills? God. He's given you breath. He's given you life. He's given you a certain amount of health, a certain amount of wealth, a certain amount of problems, because he can take them all away. So even if he doesn't cause the problems, which he usually doesn't, sometimes he does. But even if he doesn't cause the problems, he can take them, take them away and won't. Why? Well, because they're all for training. If he gives you something really nice, it's for training. If he gives you something really nasty, it's for training. Like Paul said, I know how to be abased and I know how to be about, how to abound. It's training in both because God is full spectrum. How are you going to get close to him if you don't go through the paces? How are you going to know what life is like for him? How are you going to enjoy your relationship with him? And that's really what it's about. Christ in you, the confidence of glory. Well, what's the glory? Knowing him. Well, so he's got to take you kind of on a round robin then. Sometimes you're rich, sometimes you're poor. You're always rich in problems. How fair is that? When the rest of the world is scratching and biting. You have a lot of really... Um, come on, I'm going to have to say you have many unique privileges as a Christian that you might not even know about. As a Christian, you are guaranteed that God will take care of you. You cannot die until he says so. You cannot get sick unless he says so. Whatever happens in your periphery, he had to approve it or it couldn't happen. He blesses your periphery because you're on earth. He also curses your periphery because you're on earth if you're not in his plan. Well, how fair is that? Why should other people suffer for what you do wrong? Because we're all living together. But he will actually curse or bless your periphery based on what you do. Why? To teach you. That's, those are all ruler rules. Every single ruler has this situation facing him growing up. When you're a kid in a royal household and you're growing up, these are the kinds of rules that you live under. Because you're learning how every decision you make affects others. Every decision you make has to be true to the royal house. Because that's your job. That's the house you were born into. You're born into God's house. John 14. So John 14, 26 operates on you. God causes you to know. 
Okay, but if you're not asking, then you don't want. If you don't want, then you're refusing him. If you don't want, then you're refusing your royal heritage. That's what the book of Hebrews is about, especially chapter 2. We should not neglect our inheritance of a so great salvation. He calls it inheritance, you know, uh, interchangeably in other passages. That's a, a New Testament moniker for salvation. You have the salvation. You're now to work it out. It's got to work out of you into your life. That's your job. So your job, unlike everybody who doesn't believe in Christ, is to work out your salvation. Give your salvation a workout. Learn what it is you got. You just inherited a bazillion dollars in Christ. Well, how do you use it? That's a bad thing about money. You get too much of it, you don't know how to use it. That's a bad thing about liberalism. Because they're very, very heavy-handed with other people's money. They don't know how to spend it. A lot of problems in life are not money problems. But we, we throw money at the problems and then wonder why the problem doesn't get solved. Well, because it's not a money problem to start with. Learning your salvation is not a body problem. It's a soul problem. Working out your salvation is a soul problem. So all these Christians are running around with their bodies thinking that they're being spiritual. No. So they're cursing to the world. The world is being cursed due to them. Are you going to join them? God will bless the world if you're doing what he wants. You can say all day. Well, how fair is that? I'm just sitting on my tuchus. Studying Bible? Tuchus is a Yiddish word for your, your behind. Your butt. You just sit there on your tuchus and do nothing. Yeah. And they're busy running around because they're stupid. They don't want to learn the Bible so they don't know that they're doing the wrong thing and wasting their time. And it'll all get burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, Philippians 3, 18 and 19. That's the Holy Spirit just threw at me, so there you go. How fair is that? Well, if one person has an executive job and he's given that job it's his job you can argue all day about whether he ought to get that job but it's the job he's got the executive sits and thinks and plans and designs and learns first long long learning curve the executive learns how to think and as a result of the head learning how to be ahead then the rest of the bodies can have something to do that gives them a way to get ahead because they're not getting it now they're still in the body stage their head is not developed why because they don't want to learn the word of God okay but they're still on earth they got to have something to do so God will bless them if you're getting his head in your head that's his rule God will bless them God will bless the world you just spend your day trying to apply Bible to everything you're doing that's the work, and it's not even yours. It's his, in your head. You don't even know what kind of work is going on. Because you're the fruit, not what you do. Hebrews, uh, if, uh, Isaiah 53, 11. The contract is to make sons, not to make works. Sons. Okay, well, you're a son of God if you think like God. The fact that the body is always glitchy, R Romans 7 tells you that story. Paul could think like God. It was real obvious from what he wrote. We all know that. He was given the Bible to write. He had the thinking of Christ. He even said so. 1 Corinthians 2.16 Okay, but he himself confesses in Romans 7, Acts 22, that he wasn't doing the way he knew it. His body was doing one thing, and his head was doing something else. 
So your body is not going to be obedient to. And he explains why in Romans 8, 1 through 10. The sin nature is in the body. It can't obey. All right. But at least you know, and it's the knowing that's pleasing to God, Hebrews eleven six. Meanwhile, all those bodies out there are huffing and puffing, and oh, they work so hard like Cain worked to make his vegetables. And it doesn't count. 